Hello, and welcome to Revolutions. Episode 9.19, The Conventionists. Welcome back to the show. My break was great. My vacation was great. I hope everyone out there is doing great. And let's just get right back into it. We left off last time with the fall of Victoriano Huerta, who had been president of Mexico from the 10 tragic days in February 1913 until his realization that he had lost the war with the constitutionalists and needed to make a run for it in July of 1914. Huerta's usurpation of power had not returned Mexico to the Porfirian dream of order and progress. Instead, it had triggered further chaos and revolution. Huge constitutionalist armies campaigned in the north. Zapatista guerrillas permeated the south. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the American army continued to occupy the port of Veracruz. By the time the federal army formally surrendered in August of 1914, Huerta was long gone. And as we have seen so often, the removal of a shared enemy led the victorious revolutionaries to turn on each other. So the next six months would be a whirlwind of negotiations and potential new alliances that would, by the end of the year, see Mexico not establishing a new peace, but waging a new revolutionary civil war. The old order was now dead, though. One of the first things General Alvaro Obregón did upon entering Mexico City was visit the grave of Francisco Madero and connect the constitutionalist victory to the memory of the noble apostle democracy who had been martyred by the enemies of freedom. But as I said a few episodes back when the constitutionalist revolt first got going, its leaders were not going to be following Madero's suicidal instinct for compromise and conciliation. Officials who had served under Diaz or Huerta were going to have no place in the new order. The federal army would be disarmed and then dismantled. Unlike in 1910, when Madero had failed to make the revolutionary armies the armed forces for his presidency, the constitutionalist armies, most of them now operating under good discipline and clear chains of commands, would seamlessly become the armies of the Mexican state. Economic and social reforms would be implemented at the expense of the old Porfirian oligarchy. The refusal of Carranza and Obregón, Villa and other constitutionalist generals to even consider a Madero-style compromise with their enemies led to an exodus of rich, conservative, elite families out of the country. Many packed their bags and headed for the relative safety of American-occupied Veracruz. Once there, many tried to convince the Americans to expand the scope of their operations to defend civilization from the hordes of barefooted, illiterate banditos marching into Mexico City. But when the Americans declined such further involvement, these families kept moving, and most fled to exile either in the United States or Europe. The surrender of the Federal Army and the revolutionary capture of Mexico City naturally led to some old scores being settled violently and a few necessary executions, but in the main, this would not be a violent and bloody purge. It would be a house cleaning, not a massacre. And though at least one radical paper suggested it, the guillotine would not be erected in the capital. It was, however, made very clear that the political and social dominance of the former Porfirians was over. The exact nature of the new order that would replace the old order, though, was not entirely clear yet. The remaining rump of the National Congress attempted to convene and assert some sovereignty in the political vacuum, but they were just ignored. In August of 1914, there was no government of Mexico. There was the chain of command in the constitutionalist armies and the authority of state governors who had been appointed by Carranza, but all of this was operating on martial law and arbitrary fiat. On what sovereign basis all of this rested, other than the assertions of the plan of Guadalupe, no one could say. There were supposed to be elections, but when they would be held, who could be a candidate, and under what authority the elections would take place was not established. The only thing that had been established was the deal that had been struck at the Torreon Conference in early July. That was the little summit between the representatives of Villa, Carranza, and a few other generals, and they had agreed that after the war was won, that a convention of leading revolutionary officers would convene to shape the political future of Mexico. But this had been vague language, meant to paper over divisions inside the constitutionalist camp in the final minutes before the sunset of the old order. Now that it was the dawn of the new order, they were going to have to start making specific decisions. 
It was at this uncertain moment that Obregón took his first real independent political steps of the revolution. Up until now, Obregón had been almost exclusively a military man, first a colonel in the state militia, then a general in the constitutionalist army. His days and nights had been spent focused on defeating his enemy. But now that his enemy was defeated, a different Obregón emerged, one clearly aware of the fact that he had become one of the two or three most powerful men in the country. He currently led one of the best-trained armies in Mexico and controlled the capital. Now, thanks to the nature of Obregón's character, specifically that he was not an idiot, this did not lead him to, like, declare himself dictator for life and dare anyone to dislodge him. I do feel comfortable saying, however, that by the summer of 1914, Obregón was looking around at the competition, his own record in the field, and now fancying himself a pretty plausible candidate for president. But first and foremost, Obregón wanted peace. And it was becoming very clear to everyone that the personal hostility to Carranza from a lot of other revolutionary leaders, most especially Pancho Villa, was promising nothing but future war. And so Obregón prepared to ditch Carranza in the interest of peace. And also, of course, in the interest of his own growing political ambitions. Now, from this desire to not let the country fall back into civil war, Obregón took the bold step of seeking if not an alliance, then at least detente with Pancho Villa. And he was willing to put himself at Villa's mercy to do it. Soon after taking Mexico City, Obregón took the train up to Chihuahua City, where Villa was making his headquarters, to embark on personal negotiations between the two best generals of the constitutionalist movement. For his part, Villa was amused that Obregón was coming up and thought this was going to be nothing but a photo op another show of fake constitutionalist unity for outsiders as they both continued to sharpen the long knives. But Obregón surprised Villa with a real, tangible, and apparently sincere offer. If Villa was willing to not mess around with local politics in Obregón's home state of Sonora, which Villa very much was doing at the moment, then Obregón would support an initiative to force Carranza to relinquish power. Obregón said he and his fellow officers were prepared to force Carranza into becoming provisional president only for the purposes of holding elections, elections that Carranza himself would not be allowed to participate in. Villa perked right up at this offer. This was not some staged photo op. This was a real opportunity to build a new revolutionary axis at the expense of the man Villa now hated more than anyone else in the world. Villa probably hated Carranza more than he hated Huerta at this point, which is really saying something. But this nascent obregón via alliance never really got off the ground because neither was able to deliver on the promises they made in Chihuahua City. Carranza outright rejected any notion that he could be removed so easily. I mean, Obregón was his best general, but not his only general, and Carranza was not about to be turned into a footnote in history. Meanwhile, in Sonora, the bargain agreed to by Obregón and Villa was ignored by all of their allies and proxies, and tensions and skirmishing in the state only escalated. So a few weeks later, Obregón went back to Chihuahua City, but this time he employed a different and more dangerous strategy. In between continued personal talks with Villa, Obregón met with other Division del Norte generals, telling them, not incorrectly, that the private conflict between Villa and Carranza was now becoming a public hazard, Obregón sounded out their willingness to defect away from Villa in the interest of peace, and more than a few of them indicated they were willing to do it. Villa caught wind of this, and believing Obregón's previous promises had been a pack of lies, he blew up into one of his towering rages at their next meeting and said, I have a firing squad ready to go, so prepare to be executed. It took the combined imploring of Felipe Angeles and then ultimately Villa's wife, Luz Carrao, to convince Villa that so brazenly murdering Obregón would be a fatal mistake. Obregón continued to coolly insist that he was absolutely ready to dump Carranza into the dustbin of history, saying most especially that whenever the Convention of Revolutionary Generals took place, that Carranza would not be able to control their deliberations. Villa calmed down a bit and agreed not to execute Obregón and not to boycott the convention when it convened, and he allowed his rival to leave the city alive. But though he had calmed down, Villa's murderous wrath was apparently undiminished, and it looks like he only wanted to avoid the impropriety of murdering somebody who was his guest. Villa had probably already at this point determined that a future war between him and Carranza was unavoidable, and that Obregón 
would clearly be his most formidable adversary. So, after Obregón got back on a train to Mexico City, Villa ordered that train stopped and that Obregón be executed. But just as Villa himself had once escaped Huerta's order to have him killed on a train to Mexico City, that was back in episode 9.13, the officers tasked with actually carrying out the execution did not act, either out of a miscommunication or outright insubordination. Obregón was allowed to continue on alive and well. Villa's attempt to kill Obregón was part fit of peak, but also based on a solid prognostication. And in fact, Villa's belief that Obregón would be his most formidable and dangerous adversary would come true. Now, as Obregón attempted detente with Villa, another group of constitutionalist leaders attempted detente with Emiliano Zapata. There would never be peace as long as the Zapatistas held themselves aloof from everyone. And so, in late August 1914, a small clique of generals with more radical inclinations than First Chief Carranza reached out to Zapata to see what it would take to get the Morelos guerrillas to stand down. This turned out to be nearly an impossible sell. Carranza considered the Zapatistas to be barefooted barbarians who were much more of a threat to civilization than the old Porfirian oligarchy. I mean, Carranza had political beefs with the Porfirians, and so was purging them from government, but he had, like, metaphysical disagreements with the Zapatistas. It's why the one condition of the Federal Army's surrender had been that the Federal Army along the southern line of Mexico City would stay in place until they were relieved by constitutionalist forces to stop the Zapatistas from entering the capital. And this was not anything Zapata himself had missed. And Zapata said that this Carranza does not inspire much confidence in me. I see in him much ambition and a disposition to fool people. So, for Zapata, Carranza was just another Madero, and probably even less trustworthy than Madero had been. But still, Zapata allowed a small delegation of Carrancista generals, who had proven track records of land reform in areas that they controlled, to come to Cuernavaca for a meeting. But when this little group got to Zapatista-occupied Cuernavaca, they found the Zapatistas outright hostile to the lawyers and the politicians and the tricksters who surrounded Carranza. Zapata said that any alliance with him and his liberating army of the South would have to be based on two fundamental principles. First, any potential ally had to accept the plan of Ayala, and second, Carranza had to resign. And that would be the preliminary demands for future negotiations. That was not the negotiations themselves. That was just what had to be established before Zapata would even talk to you. Now, since Carranza was obviously never going to meet those demands, the group of commissioners left empty-handed. And on September the 5th, Carranza gave an interview blasting and scoffing at Zapata. So, whenever Carranza took up the presidency, he could expect to be the latest national leader to have to deal with continued revolution in the South. And it was now becoming a more aggressive revolution in the South. On September the 8th, Zapata announced that he was invoking Article 8 of the Plan of Ayala which promised total nationalization of land and property belonging to anyone who opposed the plan of Ayala. Up until now, Zapatista-controlled areas had seen a lot of reclamation or recovery of land, villages making claims about property that had been stolen from them by the Asandados. But up until this point, Zapata had held his chiefs back from going further than restoration. He didn't even allow them to seize land for their own personal enrichment, as many expected would be the reward for their service. But after invoking Article 8, real revolutionary land distribution would commence in the South. Survey teams would be organized to go out, take stock of all the land, and more or less do to the haciendas what the haciendas had done to the villages. Encroach on their land, gobble up their property, and redistribute to the people what had for centuries been owned only by the powerful. With Zapata remaining aloof from the constitutionalists in the South, tensions between the constitutionalists in the North continued to escalate. Carranza decided to literally break ties with Villa, ordering men under his command to cut telegraph lines and literally rip up the railways, connecting areas controlled by Villa from areas controlled by Carranza. Villa then issued a declaration saying that he no longer recognized Carranza as first chief of anything, and that Mexico, all of Mexico, should join in Villa's call for a new civilian government to take over the country as soon as possible. With the rift between Villa and Carranza now becoming a real problem, 
The next rung of officers down the ladder became very concerned that this was going to lead to open war, which neither they, nor they suspected Mexicans generally, really wanted. So about 50 of these senior generals, including, eventually, Obregón, signed a proclamation demanding that the agreement made at Torreón back in July be fulfilled, that a convention of leading revolutionary generals be held immediately, a convention where the leadership of the revolution would be able to come together as a group, not as members of individual factions, and determine the best way to settle a peace for Mexico. Carranza tried to wiggle his way out of this by agreeing that a convention should be called, and then he scheduled this convention for October the 1st in Mexico City. But he tried to keep tight control over it by stipulating that the convened members should be composed of constitutionalist generals, or their designated representatives, all state governors, and other officials who had been appointed by Carranza since the beginning of the rebellion, and then other just sort of loose advisors to the first chief. This was clearly meant to be a rubber stamp convention, designed to ratify the legitimacy of Carranza's move towards the presidency. But showing the weakness of Carranza's position, almost all the rest of the revolutionary generals, including Obregón, refused to go along with this rubber stamp. The October 1st convention would take place, and it did take place, but a second convention was arranged for October the 10th. This convention would be held in the neutral city of Aguas Calientes, and this one would be attended only by revolutionary generals, who would be there representing themselves and Mexico. Carranza did not have the ability to stop the Aguas Calientes Convention, and could only insist with frustration that it would be merely advisory and not bind him personally in any way to anything. The Aguas Calientes Convention convened on October the 10th, 1914, to decide the fate of Mexico. Unlike the Maderista era, when the soldiers had been shunted aside so the civilians could take over, this time it would be reversed. Civilians were barred from participating in the convention. The soldiers had risked their lives, spilled their blood, and won the war, and they were going to have the last word. About 150 total delegates showed up, either the senior generals themselves or delegates appointed to represent them, on the basis of one representative per 1,000 soldiers. Now, were there 150,000 revolutionary soldiers under arms at that moment? No, probably not, and credentials were inflated. But still, nearly all the factions, save for the moment the Zapatistas, were represented. It was a dangerous moment, as Mexico had a long history of military rule. But while the men who gathered at Aguascalientes were all military men now, most of them were civilians who had been converted into soldiers by the revolution, and they all assumed some kind of civilian government would inherit the country. There was no support for setting up a permanent military dictatorship. That was not on the table. Pancho Villa himself stayed away, but he did send a group of about 40 dedicated villistas who would be there to ensure that the boss wasn't screwed over, but most especially to make sure that Carranza was screwed over. Obregón was there in person as a strong moderate presence inside a group oriented towards peace. That group included most of the generals who had signed the proclamation calling for the convention in the first place, and they formed the bulk of the membership of the convention. A much smaller minority were hardcore carrancistas, whose fortunes and careers were tied to their patron, and who were there to ensure the convention did not get rid of the first chief. After convening on October the 10th, they all swore an oath and affixed their signatures to a Mexican flag, stating that they would abide by the convention's collective decisions. Then two days later, they declared themselves sovereign. The Aguas Calientes Convention would now constitute the sovereign authority of Mexico. Carranza refused to recognize this bold claim and continued to insist that it was merely an advisory body and that as first chief, sovereign authority still rested with him. But Pancho Villa took a different approach. He came down to Aguas Calientes. He fixed his own signature to the flag and announced that he would abide by the decisions of the convention. Avila went back to his headquarters, but while he stayed away, he left his interests in the capable hands of Felipe Angeles. And Angeles became one of the most dominant players at the convention. Angeles led the Villistas in pursuit of conciliation and compromise with everyone else in the room. This was a cunning strategy that would further draw a contrast between Villa and Carranza, because the Carranza guys were there offering no compromise and no conciliation, 
They were there to insist that Carranza was now the supreme national leader of Mexico and demand that everyone else signal their due fealty and submission. The Villistas, meanwhile, had no such lordly demands. And the reason the Villistas had no such lordly demands comes down to one of the vaguely articulated but still supremely relevant ideological distinctions between Villa and Carranza. Though he may himself had only been dimly aware of it, Villa was in the middle of trying to revive federalism as a major political philosophy in Mexico. As we saw way back in the first couple episodes of this series, and all of the Bolivar episodes, the conflict between centralists and federalists in the 19th century was the dividing line of any number of civil wars, coups, revolts, and revolutions in Latin America. In Mexico, federalism had been permanently abandoned when Benito Juarez and the liberals, in their struggles first against conservatives and then against the French, embraced strong central authority. This was obviously cemented by Juarez's successor, if not exactly heir, Porfirio Diaz. Federalism had been virtually extinct in Mexico since the 1860s, but now Villa was trying to bring it back, thanks mostly to his own natural proclivities. Pancho Villa does not seem to have had any national ambitions, and you can count me as among those convinced that Villa was not interested in becoming president. That was never his ambition. He wanted local power in Chihuahua, of course, but beyond that, he had no interest in imposing his will on anyone, and readily invited generals and other political leaders from various parts of Mexico to go home and do as they pleased. That's the future of Mexico that Pancho Villa envisioned. Carranza, on the other hand, was a strong executive centralist, whose hero was the liberal centralist Juarez, and who, in another life, probably winds up as an obscure minister in the cabinet of alternate reality President Bernardo Reyes. For Carranza, a strong central government was essential to order and progress, so Villa was able to compromise on all kinds of things, tell everybody, hey, go home and do what you want. Carranza could not and would not make those same compromises. Now, all of that said, Villa may not have personally had national ambitions, but his man Felipe Angeles sure did. And Angeles recognized a way to turn this vaguely neutral convention into a vehicle of pure viismo, a machine that would propel him to the presidency and that would be to bring in the Zapatistas. With one delegate per thousand soldiers, a Zapatista delegation, aligned with the Villistas, could pop Carranza out of the leadership of the revolution and settle all things in their own favor. So Angeles stepped forward and proposed that on moral grounds, on political grounds, and for reasons of revolutionary honor, that the not-present Zapatistas be formally invited to send a delegation. Most of the other guys in the room agreed to this proposal, because they were there to ensure post-revolutionary peace, and unless the Zapatistas were satisfied, there would never be peace. So the convention blessed Angeles personally going to Morelos to invite them. So Angeles got on a train, he headed down to Mexico City, and then up to Cuernavaca to personally call on Zapata. Now this is kind of crazy and a little dangerous, because remember, last time Angeles was in Morelos, he was the commander of federal army forces trying to defeat the Zapatistas. But Angeles was convinced that his relatively compassionate tour of duty and Zapata's desire for an alliance with Villa would see him through this without getting shot. And he was right. The two men met on October the 20th, and Zapata started by praising Angeles as the only man who had ever fought him honorably. This was quite an endorsement. But Zapata was wary of doing anything that might compromise the plan of Ayala, and recognizing the sovereign authority of some convention of northern generals was a surefire way of doing just that. So the two men had to come up with a plan. And the plan was this. Zapata would send 26 delegates to represent the army of the south, but they would go merely as observers until the convention agreed to ratify the principles of the plan of Ayala. Angelis believed that he could pull this off, and so the delegates were appointed. But Zapata himself would not go, nor would any of the other principal chiefs of the army. None of them seemed to have much in the way of national ambitions. Those who did want to go were the civilian-type intellectuals who had come to Morelos after the fighting started. They had come to provide ideological support and give rhetorical ammunition, not actually pick up a rifle and fire it. So almost every single one of the 26 delegates had to be hastily commissioned as colonels in the Southern Army so they could participate. 
So then this group of newly minted Zapatista colonels piled back onto the train and headed north. Only very conspicuously, they did not first get off in Aguascalientes. First, they continued further north another hundred miles or so to where Villa had set up his headquarters. And it was only after receiving Villa's personal assurances that he supported them and the plan of Ayala that they went back to Aguascalientes. But on the morning of October the 27th, the Zapatista delegation was welcomed into the hall to thunderous applause. And for the first time, all revolutionary factions were in one place at one time, and they did something kind of surprising. They endorsed the plan of Ayala. Now, of course, not everyone at the convention was some radical agragista. I mean, most of them weren't. But as Angelis had promised, he managed to engineer the overwhelming approval of the principles of the plan of Ayala by the convention. And this committed the sovereign authority of Mexico and the future national government of Mexico to pretty radical land redistribution and, like, social justice. Even Obregón and his guys went along with this, even though it was far more radical than anything they wanted. And this was because they genuinely wanted peace. And besides, plans and promises were made to be broken. But though the embrace of agrarian justice was a pretty big deal in terms of the long constitutional history of Mexico— for the moment, it took a backseat to the real battle that was now at hand. How to settle things between Villa and Carranza to avoid civil war. And this is when Obregón stepped forward. On October the 31st, he introduced a resolution that called on both Villa and Carranza to resign simultaneously. This was the best and probably only way to ensure future peace. To replace Carranza as executive, Obregón suggested the little-known and little-supported leader from San Luis Potosí, Eulalio Gutierrez. The resolution calling for this double resignation was, of course, Obregón continuing his attempts to stop a revolutionary civil war. But, let's face it, removing Carranza and Villa at the same time would mean that Obregón was bound to emerge from the convention as the preeminent leader in Mexico. Probably only Felipe Ángeles would be able to rival him. And Ángeles actually helped Obregón secure passage of this revolution, though probably not, as Obregón hoped, in the interest of actually getting Villa to resign. Villa and Angelis were playing their own game, but it was to more thunderous applause that Angelis read a short message from Villa saying, Not only do I resign, I suggest the convention have both me and Carranza shot. Now, we should not take this at face value. Villa and Angelis were gambling that Carranza would never step down, so their bluff would never be called. It was well known that while the convention met, Villa was continuing to beef up his arms and talking quite openly about how the shooting would start again soon. By being the first to publicly agree to resign, though, Villa got to portray himself as selfless and patriotic and Carranza as a grasping, dictatorial megalomaniac. And Carranza played his part perfectly. After attempting a few formulas to remain in power, Ultimately, Carranza said the convention is not sovereign, it is not binding on me, and I'm not going to retire. The convention then delivered an ultimatum. They gave Carranza until November the 10th to resign. And when that deadline passed, the convention declared him in rebellion. Angeles and Villa had played things perfectly. The convention was the sovereign authority of Mexico. They had in hand a flag signed by all the other generals agreeing to abide by the decrees of the convention, and the convention had just declared Carranza illegitimate and in rebellion. To complete this deft political maneuver, Villa was then declared commander-in-chief of the convention's armed forces. But as it turns out, solemn oaths and signatures on the flag do not count for as much as they should. Not only did the hardcore Carrancistas walk out, but so too did most of the moderates, including Obregón, who now decided to reconcile with the first chief. Now, one might think that Obregón would have sided with Villa over Carranza, whose unwillingness to step aside was now the thing plunging Mexico back into the war that he had been trying to avoid. And it's still a matter of speculation and argument why he went back. Probably it was a mix of being more socially and politically aligned with the conservative Carranza rather than the radical Villistas and Zapatistas. Also, probably mixed in was personal hatred of Villa for, you know, ordering his execution. Plus, on top of that, there was the recognition that even if he personally sided with Villa, that many of his comrades and fellow officers would not. If he crossed the lines, he'd do it alone. Obregón's goal had been to avoid a civil war, 
he had failed. And so all that was left to do now was pick a side. And he picked Carranza. Carranza fatefully welcomed Obregón back, rather than excommunicating him for the months Obregón had spent trying to get rid of Carranza. So after the declaration that Carranza was in rebellion, the constitutionalist forces pulled out of Mexico City and reconsolidated near Veracruz, knowing that they would very likely lose any direct encounter with the Division del Norte. Villa immediately prepared to march on the capital, but in the meantime, someone had to occupy the city, and that someone, by default, was the Zapatistas. Now, Zapata never had any desire or ambition to capture Mexico City, and his men were all peasant guerrillas, so it was with some awkwardness and a hint of hesitant embarrassment that the Morelos guerrillas walked into Mexico City on November the 24th. The culture clash was sharp. Most of these guys had spent their lives in villages or working on haciendas, and the biggest city they had ever encountered was Cuernavaca. And here they were now technically in control of one of the great world capitals. They were unsure of exactly what was expected of them. And there's a story that one night a fire company went blaring off down the road, and a company of Zapatistas, having never seen such a thing, assumed it was some kind of enemy attack, and they opened fire. It'd be funny, except they killed all 12 firemen. Zapata himself was not thrilled about having to leave home, and rather than take up residence in some posh house, as all the constitutionalists had done after Obregón took the city back in August, Zapata pointedly occupied a small hotel room near the train station, so he could get back to Morelos as soon as possible. Press in the city swarmed him now, but Zapata mostly refused to give them more than a few monosyllabic answers. And it was with great relief that the first advanced divisions of Villa's Division del Norte arrived at the outskirts of Mexico City on November the 26th. Two days after that, Zapata was on a train to Cuernavaca, and most of his men soon followed. So that brings us to the great meeting that will conclude today's episode— the meeting of Villa and Zapata. Zapata agreed to host Villa at a small house in the small city of Xochimilco, which lays between Cuernavaca and Mexico City. And on December the 4th, 1914, Villa and his entourage arrived. About 60 men crammed into a large upstairs room, and we have a first-hand English account of the moment they met, and every book I read just quotes that in full, so I will do the same and this comes from an American representative that Villa had invited along to witness. This witness said, quote, After the exchange of a few greetings, these men, who had never seen each other before, but who had been working in accord for some months, locked arms and went to the municipal school building where they were to hold a conference. They were ushered into a large upstairs room, which was immediately crowded with about three score persons intimate with the leaders. There were only a few chairs in the room. Generals Villa and Zapata sat at a large oval table, the two men making a decided contrast. To my left sat Paulino Martinez, one of General Zapata's confidential men and a delegate to the convention. Next to him was General Villa, tall, robust, weighing about 180 pounds, with a complexion almost as florid as a German, wearing an English helmet, a heavy brown sweater, khaki trousers, leggings, and heavy riding shoes. Zapata, to his left, with his immense sombrero, sometimes shading his eyes so that they could not be seen, dark complexion, thin face, a man very much shorter in stature than Villa and weighing probably around 130 pounds. He wore a short black coat, a large light blue silk neckerchief, pronounced lavender shirt, and used alternatively a white handkerchief with a green border and another one with all the colors of the flowers. He had on a pair of black, tight-fitting Mexican trousers with silver buttons down the outside seam of each leg. Villa did not have a sign of jewelry on, nor any color in any of his personal adornment. End quote. They sat awkwardly together, and Zapata decided to loosen things up a bit by ordering some cognac. But there is a little quirk to Villa that I have somehow managed to not tell you about yet, and that is that he did not drink and he did not smoke. Now, if you walk into the Mexican Revolution with some minimal amount of information, you probably assume that Pancho Villa must have been some cigar-chomping, tequila-swigging wild man, and it certainly fits with his cultivated public persona. But he never drank, and he never smoked. He was stone sober. And he didn't go around dressed to the nines. He was going around in, like, frumpy khaki clothes. It would be easier to imagine Zapata this way as a peasant warrior, you know, bread, water, sackcloth, and ashes, that kind of thing. 
but he was the one who liked fancy clothes and enjoyed drinking. So Villa did not drink, but when the cognac arrived, he didn't want to insult his host, and so he gamely took a shot and nearly choked on it, calling for water to help him not die. Now this no doubt shocked Zapata, because I mean, how is the legendary Pancho Villa, the northern bandito, choking on a little swig of cognac? It's ridiculous. But he played it cool and diplomatic and tried not to make Villa feel too bad or embarrassed. So the cognac didn't really loosen things up, and ultimately after about a half an hour or so, the halting conversation turned to Carranza, and it was here that things finally lubricated as Villa and Zapata bonded over complaining about Carranza. Villa said that Carranza was high and mighty, and Zapata replied, I always said so. I always told them that Carranza is a son of a bitch. Thus, their alliance was cemented by a mutual loathing of a shared enemy. And probably like a third of all friendships in human history have been cemented the same way. Now, what helped them also cement their alliance was the fact that they shared a common federalist vision. Neither one of them wanted to be president of Mexico, so there would be no contest for that office. Both wanted local power and what was best for their own people, but that meant they did not want a strong central executive. And they agreed that the national government, such as it was, should focus on foreign affairs and a few other small administrative things, which neither Villa nor Zapata really cared about. In this, Gutierrez was a great choice for president because he had no national following of his own, and as Villa put it, would make no trouble. After they concluded their initial talk in the big group meeting, the two leaders retired with just a few others to plan a joint military campaign against Carranza and the Constitutionalists. Zapata would attack and capture Puebla City, while Villa and the Division del Norte would move against Obregón's army in the vicinity of Veracruz. Villa promised Zapata ammunition, supplies, artillery, whatever he needed. And how could they lose? After this meeting, the one time the two legendary revolutionaries met face to face, they traveled together down the road to Mexico City and called on Gutierrez in the presidential palace after parading their joint conventionist army through the streets of the capital. In a famous photograph, staged after the repeated pleadings of journalists and photographers, Villa sat in the presidential chair, looking jovial and laughing, while Zapata leaned next to him in his signature dour slump. This was only for a minute, but Villa in the president's chair was a signal to Mexico and the world that Pancho Villa was now the preeminent warlord of Mexico. And at that moment, he was. But to offer some foreshadowing, without spoilers, this is the peak of Villa's career. This is the peak of Villa's life. Sitting there for that one minute in the presidential chair with a big grin on his face and victory against his enemies surely just a battle or two away. He was, after all, undefeated in the field, and he did not anticipate any blemishes to his unblemished record. But that is not how it went, and despite so much that was working in Villa's favor at that moment, his long-term prospects were not nearly as bright as everyone seemed to believe, and this was thanks in part to the Americans deciding to throw their weight decisively to Carranza. And next week, the civil war between the conventionists and the constitutionalists will fully erupt, and Villa will have to face an enemy armed to the teeth with the guns of Veracruz. Cruz.